Right. So for the demo today, what we're going to demo now is the, the concept of flow mapping. The setup is uh, quite simple. I have a, a um, Spiron test center that is generating traffic for me and that is connected to an HC2, one of our platforms. Um, two links going in so I have duplicated traffic going in and then um, basically I take the input and just pipe it onto a different port so I can connect it to a machine running Wireshark so you can see the duplicates and then as soon as we turn on deduplication you see how that cleans up. The other demo that we're uh, going to show is um, the NetFlow generation. So I have another set of ports on the Spirant uh, piping in traffic uh, that is taken by the uh, GigaSmart blade and that generates traffic or NetFlow information um, sent over to a Plixer scrutinizer and um, we can log on to that interface and see how uh, NetFlow is being generated. There isn't anything else in that particular network. So that's the uh, extent of the uh, setup. So can I just ask, sorry, for the dedupe stuff, are you, and if you covered this earlier, I apologize, are you simulating like if you were watching a frame flow through the network hitting multiple taps on its way through, yes. you get in the same, well, so do you have to, cache that data for some small period of time because it's obviously not going to hit simultaneously from three taps, right? It's going to be a sequential. Right. So do you have to cache it in order to, or hold on to it for a little bit to say, well, if it's gone through within half a second and we get a dupe, we'll dedupe and then we'll pass it on. Right. So when you create that flow map with a dedupe, mm -hmm. uh, what we call GSOP, a GigaSmart operation on it, you can actually specify how big of a buffer to use. The default is 50,000 microseconds. So we'll hold that data for that long. So there's right. always a lag between what you're actually seeing on the wire, live wire, versus what the Gigamon solution, the fabric, is actually producing to the Wireshark. And we're about 50,000 cool. uh, 50, microseconds behind. So that's a very important thing to note because you're spot on that um, the, the amount of time, um, you know, that you could buffer the, the packets, you know, determines how good your deduplication solution is. Right. There's not just a, for a few microseconds, we can actually buffer all the way up to 500 milliseconds. It's configurable. So you have the ability to pretty much weed out all deduplicates. Right. If you're having something right. as high as 500 milliseconds. That's a lot. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. you know, if it's more than that, you probably have some issues in the network design. <laughs> What's the analyzer experience with this dedupe? buffer? Do you, do you feel, feel the first copy of that packet to the analyzer immediately and just remember that you've done that for 50 milliseconds? That's right. Or, okay, okay, so it, it isn't delayed in any, no. in any way. And can you recognize the same packet regardless of different types of encapsulation? No, it has to be the, the exact same packet. Same frame? Same frame, yeah. All right. So we'll jump here. While Noam's setting that up, I'll also mention, though, there are some knobs you can turn to say what you want to be the same packet. For example, time to live, uh, you may want to take that out to make sure that you're deduplicating across north-south boundaries. Interesting. Yeah, that figures. So, so we can ignore the Ethernet header as well in that case? There's a variety of things that you can ignore. I see. Yes. So if you want sequence to be ignored, you can do that. In most cases, people would want to see that, but we do have certain people that ask for that. But you Sorry. Like a like a virtual tap, I'm going to see a native Ethernet frame from a from a V host, <coughs> and then somewhere else in the infrastructure, if it's say VXLAN encapsulated. Uh, in that case, I don't think that we'll be able to see it. We're looking for the packets to be the same, uh, so they have to be within certain areas. But there are some knobs that you can turn to make it more to your choosing. Gotcha. Yep. So logging into our uh, Fabric Manager, I can launch. Uh, a connection to the HC2 that we saw in my demo. Um, I'm going to show you quickly the flow maps that we have. Right now we have three flow maps. The first one is a deduplication map. Um, the other two have to do with the NetFlow generation and just replicating traffic on a uh, one of the virtual machines. Um, 
so we can see the traffic going into that virtual machine actually replicated onto Wireshark as well so we can actually uh, monitor. So in terms of creating a flow map, it's very, very simple. I mean, it's connecting a network port to a tool port with some logic in between. So going into the very first uh, section up there at the top, right, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to connect a network port, whichever it is, to the network port side. And I'm going to select a tool port. And notice how they're already marked as network and tool, right? So now I've made this connection. I can set up the, the policy to be either a map, so I will put in some logic in between, or I can just do a pass through, so everything coming on this one port is replicated onto the next port, okay? So, and, and you could go on through this, create uh, associated GigaSmart operations, which we haven't talked about yet. So I'm just gonna save you from that particular uh, pain point right now. And um, go directly to our uh, deduplication here. So changing my policy to just count the packets, I can look on the Wireshark device and immediately you see all these retransmissions occurring. Hand in hand, I can go into my statistics and all I want to care about is dedupe. And my counters are telling me how many packets came in, how many packets, clear that for one second. Okay. So how many packets are coming in, how many packets are coming out, and over here, how many packets I'm seeing that are duplicates. Now remember, I'm not dropping, I'm just counting. I, I can't read those numbers. Was it? I'm sorry. Because outs were different or the same, or uh, I'll, let's go back so you could see it I again. To read out the numbers. So it was uh, sixteen thousand in, sixteen thousand out, and eight thousand being duplicate. So showing you twice the amount. Going back to the one of the uh, the policy maps that I have and changing that policy from a count to a drop and applying the OK, I'm clean of any duplicates. Yep. You want to go to? Sure. Let me cover NetFlow and then I'll come back. Yep. And then exactly. Come back to... Okay. Oops, let's go back all the way to the beginning. Yeah, it went all the way to the beginning. I'd like to just point out that the real value here, of course, is that the tools that people are used to using, uh, they, they work very well because they use up a lot of processing, and they're quite expensive to be able to use. So the problem is that if you've got duplicate packets coming through, that means more work that that has to do. So every time that we take out a duplicate, that's less work that has to be done by the tools, which optimizes the overall infrastructure. So that's where you know, Gigamon's real benefit comes into play. You can also, in that case, really kind of streamline the analysis process once the human's looking at it because, like in that Wireshark case, if you've got a whole bunch of duplicate frames in there, you may be trying to figure out is that just, you know, an instrumentation issue because of the multiple capture points or is there actually frame duplication happening in the network? You make an excellent point because if you really want to focus on what's going on, get rid of the crud in between. Yeah. That's what you have to do. Yeah, if you're trying and to that's an actual what... application issue, you know, and you want to... Yes. I'll be trying to figure out, is this, is, do I actually have something weird going on in the network, or is this just some capture? At least that's a good place to start. Sometimes you're going to need to expand it, because it may not be a problem with the voice itself. It may be something else that's stepping on it. Yeah. One other question about that, when you define your application like voice, can you define just RTP streams, or can you put signaling in there as well? 
Um, how granular can you get? There's a variety of things. Like you said, RTP streams is one way of doing it. Uh, you might also be doing it by a VLAN filter, for example. So there's a variety of ways that you can pull information. Okay. Ananda. Excuse me. In a, in a very large deployment, is the Gigamon infrastructure flat, or do you have a hierarchy of, of collectors and filters? And that kind of thing? Uh, hierarchy for the visibility nodes or for the, for the actual collectors? The... the Basically, do you have aggregation layers of, of, yeah. of the collection? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or do we have to go flat to... No, you know? there is, in fact, in fact the, the larger the network becomes, the, the visibility network becomes, it begins to start having the same principles of a production infrastructure. You would have kind of an edge layer, and then that connects to kind of a, a core layer. Do you have a way to maintain precise timing for the, the tool experience in that case? Yeah, absolutely. So that's the reason why we have time stamping. I see. Right, so so that you can you can timestamp the traffic before it um, it gets set to it. Is there a standard for that, or what's the how's that done? Um, you want to answer that, Dominic? Well, what we do in terms of timestamping packet data is we we utilize either PTP or a PPS output from a GPS receiver yep. to to synchronize each one of our nodes. That's where you get the time. That's where we get the time, and then we we insert that time into the trailer. There really is no industry standard for how to implement timestamping and exchange that with tools. So we, we define a standard for how our platform works, and we share that with tool vendors, and tool vendors implement to that standard. In fact, Wireshark implements to that. So Wireshark can ignore the system time. Exactly, and, 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 and it uses our timestamp trailer when it, yeah. when it exists. Ah, cool. Great. Another question. This is with Dr. Technology here. Do I need to, as I'm feeding data into these capture units, feed in you know, simply things like span ports, or can I make this just a cohesive part of my infrastructure where I'm flowing everything through it all the time? Like yeah, so you, you can feed data to it, to it in any way, right? If, if you have a policy as an organization to only use span ports, that's perfectly fine. You can feed that into us, right? Uh, if you have a policy of having you know, taps, because and and by the way, more and more newer data centers are actually designing in, designing in the taps at the point of data center construction, right? Uh, that's fine. We can take that too. And I guess that's what I'm wondering is, can I use your device as a tap device, or do I need to run it through a tap and then into? You could do both. Can do both. So you can actually. Ha so we have both. Um, good question. Because we've got inbuilt taps that actually go into the devices, or you can also have standalone taps. Or maybe the customer already has a tap infrastructure in place, and we can take it from that. So it's completely open that way in terms of the choices that you have. And the last thing that I also want to add to that question is, um, and I think this goes in very well with the concept of you know pervasive visibility. Um, typically, what is done is that as you get closer towards the edge of the infrastructure, you, know, you want to have a way to efficiently grab all the data, kind of do all the pre-processing and pre-filtering, and then send that back to the intelligent nodes here. But the, the value that Gigamon offers is you have a uniform experience as you go from the edge all the way to, um, to, the, to the core of the infrastructure. Right? So typically, these value-added functions would be done at a certain layer of aggregation. Doesn't make sense to be doing deduplication at the edge, for example. Right? So uh, that's how this, this whole thing works. So I think uh, Noam already covered most of these things, but this is a pictorial representation of how deduplication works. You know, works for both IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and essentially, we can do uh, deduplication uh, by detecting any similar packets which happen uh, in a certain configurable time window. Okay. Let's move to the next one. And by the way, you'll see a very similar one uh, being shown in, in every picture, which is you'll see kind of the flow mapping, which is the way in terms of how we select the flows, and then a certain GigaSmart operation, right? Um, the next one is NetFlow. This is by far one of the most popular um, in an application since we introduced this earlier this year. And the reason is pretty simple. You know, I think all of us know about routers and switches that get overwhelmed in terms of generating NetFlow traffic. Because the primary job of a switch and router is to actually generate, I'm sorry, switch the traffic or route the traffic to the specific destination. Uh, NetFlow oftentimes is an afterthought. Yeah, that's, Number that's two. a real problem I was dealing with earlier this year. Um, seems like the ASR 9K is actually worse at handling NetFlow than, say, an ASR 1K. Exactly. I can do more of the 1K than I can do with the 9K. The 9Ks are just 
my caches kept filling up and I, I just couldn't get the data at the rate that I wanted to get it at. On top of that too, some, some line cars only support sample net flow. So you, you know, you're not even getting the, the full stream. Yeah. So when you look at the gamut of problems that, that an operator or administrator faces, you know, we talked about one of them, which is the switches around us getting overwhelmed. Number two, increasingly there are many folks who go for a multi-vendor infrastructure. So, you know, um, Juniper supports JFlow, Cisco supports NetFlow slash IPFX, you know, Brocade supports SFlow, Extreme supports SFlow. It becomes really hard to manage and get a consistent view across all of these. And then you layer in the aspect of somebody's doing NetFlow v5, somebody's doing you know, uh, IPFX, it's a mess, right? So you can actually take all the pain out of it and say, just give me the traffic and I'll do all the processing. Of, of generating the NetFlow records and then send it over to, uh, to, to the destination. So um, essentially this helps to optimize the production network. There's no additional load that's created on the production network and it's a highly scalable system because on a simple HC2, which is a two rack unit system, we can actually support up to 200 gig of processing. When you uh, cluster them together into multiple units in a single rack, you can have four terabits of processing as far as you know, how much of processing can be done for NetFlow. So a very scalable way of doing it in a centralized manner. And you can, of course, chain this with uh, other operations that are done. So at this point, I'll move over to, I'll switch over to um, uh, uh, a continuation of the demo. And uh, we'll try to keep the, the same slide here yes. so that we don't have to keep switching. Yes. Maybe you can just minimize that. That's one yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so back again to our script here, to our uh, uh, web interface. The NetFlow generation policy is actually a, a GigaSmart operation, right? Where I can specify the operation and attach to it um, a flow record, just like we would do on, a, on, a, on an exporter, a router, or, or any other device. Um, we can do v5, v9, and IP fix. Um, so from that matter, you know, it's it's relatively a, a simple operation to do. And once you have it, how do you tie that to the interface indexes? I'm just sort of thinking. You know, on a normal NetFlow record, I've got the. Um, I've got the interface indexes in there and they're matched up to my router or whatever's generating the, the, the stuff. But how are you doing that? You have an interface ID. So you know where the traffic is coming from on your interface. Well, you kind of sort of fake it a little bit so that, so my collector still thinks it's coming direct from the router? The collector knows it's coming from the exporter, which is, your GigaSmart device, but the GigaSmart device in the NetFlow record can specify which port this traffic that I'm generating traffic on is coming so map, on my map chassis. Through that way. Yeah. So I can do a mapping, say, I'll port see, I'll one, see one, the interface X1. of the Gigamon. Yeah, I'll see that interface. <coughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Okay. Uh, one, five, two, eleven. So, here are the two interfaces on the uh, HC2, on the GigaSmart device that is generating my traffic. And um, you could see down here the different flow records that are created um, as per the standards, right? I mean, so I, I know which uh, top talkers I have. I can scroll down and look at, uh, you know, a save report that I created that uh, represents 12 or so ports that I, I randomly chose. Um, so if I wanted to, could I do a bit more, com like a more complex policy, I guess, and say, like a sampled NetFlow type thing, would I say, you know, this particular sampled data, I want to go over to that collector, this other sampled NetFlow data, I want to go over to some other collector somewhere else. Yes, or like, and we, we can support up to six. Not just sample, like um, uh, flexible NetFlow uh, type maps and things. So we do support IP fix, right? But the point is, you're collecting data from your network. 
you collect it from different points, you can associate them with different NetFlow generation policies and associate them with, out to, with up to six collectors, just like Plixer to generate your traffic. So this is for um, last full hour of traffic. The, the uh, generation has been running just for a little bit. So that's what we're seeing. Nothing before and obviously nothing yet. Uh, here, let's do last hour. <clears throat> So, so while that's happening, let me just add a couple of other things. The reason why we're able to do all of this advanced traffic intelligence is because at the end of the day, what we have in these systems is a very high performance compute engine. That's the way to be looking at it, right? So it's, it's, it's very easy for us to, to make this you know, highly portable. And that's the reason why, irrespective of the form factor, you have all of these traffic intelligence applications that are made available you know, through the system. Okay. Can you go back to the presentation? Yep. So, thanks, Noam. So, just to finish up this section so that we can speed along, um, we talked about GTP correlation and the challenges with respect to mobile um, you know, um, provider networks where the use of GTP um, makes it more difficult to just do simple flow mapping and get access to subscriber level information, right? So this is the way in terms of correlating between the control plane and the user plane and improving the efficacy of the tools because they don't now need to be doing GDP correlation. They are now getting subscriber level you know, data that they could now consume. A second way is, which is a, a high, a key differentiator in terms of how we do this is a capability called a flow view. And what this does is rather than um, you know, sending um, an arbitrary samples of traffic across your network, what we can do is we can do a flow aware sampling of subscriber devices and then pick a certain percentage of traffic that needs to be sent to it. So you can have a range of IP devices um, across which you want to sample because typically any uh, service provider, for example, would have premium customers as well as commodity consumers, right? Um, and you want to be having a higher level of SLA to be provided for your premium uh, subscribers. This is a way in terms of how you could do that. So all of these can be, can be in a service chain, as mentioned before, and the last one is adaptive packet filtering. The best way to look at that is content-based filtering, where you can look at it from, from at any point in the packet. Um, the last part I want, to, uh, I want to cover here is multi-tiered security. Uh, all of, a lot of what we've talked about so far is out of band. Uh, this is a way in terms of how we could also get the benefits of visibility in an in-band infrastructure. This is typically how um, typical security device would get installed in a traditional network infrastructure. Now there are a few challenges here and the challenges are that the network teams and the security teams are often at loggerheads because it's a very tight maintenance window within which you need to maintain all of your um, you know, uh, operations management and, and uh, maintenance windows. It can also be a single point of failure. You can also uh, be subject to the high-end processing that is required in the security tools, which means that there's a disparity between the speed of the network and the speed uh, at which the throughput of the security device works. And of course, you're trying to do all of these things within a certain um, security, within a cost envelope. The way you would solve the same thing using an inline uh, system would be the traffic that comes from the edge router going to the core switch would be intercepted by a visibility fabric node. And rather than sending it directly to the core switch, it would send it to the intrusion pre prevention system. And then whatever, whatever is filtered and sent back to the intrusion prevention system is then sent to the core switch. Same thing for the return direction as well. Whatever is sent by the core switch is sent first to the intrusion protection, prevention system before it is uh, sent over to, uh, the, uh, to the extra net. You can also have out-of-band devices being used in the same way, as well as whatever we saw with respect to NetFlow um, you know, collection, they can all be done in a synergistic way because the reality today of any <coughs> multi-tiered security infrastructure is there's not one single device, there's a plethora of devices that are used and this provides you a way in terms of having a distribution of traffic across it. Now the question that you might ask is, is, is what if this becomes a single point of failure, right? That's the reason why in the event of any failure happening, the relays close 
and you have configurable ways to either have fail open or fail safe so that that does not become a single point of failure. And you can also have you know, other redundancy scenarios with which this is implemented. So with that, I'm going to switch gears here to um, uh, active visibility in a software-defined world because I don't want to make sure that we have enough time for Sish to do the virtual solution here. Question. So, yeah, quick one on the GTP. Are you, it said, I think you said it was subscriber aware and so on. So are, is, it, is this just from watching the initial GTP session set up and then you're caching you know, the MISDM and, and that kind of thing? So you're just keeping the information about this particular tunnel identifier yeah. is this MISDM and this ADN and so forth? Yes, yes. Okay, and you can then use those for filtering purposes as well, presumably? That's correct. Okay. That's correct, yeah. And